Okay, so workmen or builders doing renovations in... Oh, 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 that's not good. Okay. Uh, builders doing renovations in houses in uh, the UK uh, sometimes find these things in the foundations. They're stoneware <coughs> bottles. It should be actually an image of a stoneware bottle previously, but it's gone. Um, known, commonly known as Bellamine or Bartman jugs. They're sometimes found upside down, um, often with a cork stopper intact in the mouth and sealed with wax. When they're opened up, they are uh, frequently found to hold pins and nails, sometimes also human hair, uh, nail pairings occasionally, and also liquid sometimes, which has been identified as urine. Um, they're often inside these stoneware bus vessels, but not always, and have become known as witch bottles, and seem are uh, usually interpreted as a form of protective or apotropaic magic. Uh, they're found especially in southeast England, but also as far afield as New England. So the contents inside them, oh no, what's happened to the pictures? Oh dear, this is sad. I can see them on here, but I can't. I wonder what the... Maybe, huh. just, maybe you press escape. Uh-huh. Um, we... No, okay, we can't no see it's them. not, they're not letting them we show stones. them. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, not to worry, we'll manage. Um, Which <laughs> is... <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Right. So anyway, they've been studied by, they were studied by Ralph Merrifield firstly, um, and he had a 90, very well-known now 1987 book um, that looked at these in the context of other protective magical devices. And the deposits seem to date to the period of witchcraft accusations and trials um, from the 16th and 17th centuries. This, of course, was also a time of great religious change, uh, political upheaval, you know, think about the period around and immediately following uh, Henry VIII's break from Rome, and then going through the, the English Civil War. These uh, Bellamine bottles, or Bartman jugs, were produced in the Rhineland uh, from the 15th century, and they have this very sort of distinctive broad belly and narrow neck, this, and with this male face, a sort of officing, often grimacing male face, and then a, a medallion on the body that's applied in clay before the vessel is fired. And the earliest examples of their use as witch bottles in England seem to date from the mid to late 16th century, and the most common uh, date from the 17th century. So they persist right through the 17th century and onwards. The Bartman vessel itself um, stopped, so this is just an example of the grimacing face. The vessel stopped being made in the 18th century, but the practice of witch bottles persisted uh, often in, uh, in relation to these sort of glass steeple uh, vessels um, and it persists until the, very, the present day in, in various forms. Of course we have to remember that these bottles were also often kept for long periods and so the deposits can potentially be decades after the bottle itself was made so that complicates things but documentary sources do seem to sort of tally with the findings of these vessels and suggest that they seem to appear in the latter half of the 16th century. They're found particularly in threshold sites. They're found uh, at boundaries, they're found at chimneys, doors, house walls, um, and also some later examples found at field boundaries, town ditches and walls, and they're often inverted as well, and even in graves as well. So these seem to be liminal or threshold sites. They seem to be sort of concerned with boundaries. This is also a practice, as it was, this was a nice map <laughs> that isn't there anymore, um, but you can see the reference. Um, a practice distinct to England, it's also found in New England, and they first appear in South East England, um, and the practice seems to sort of spread out from London, and that, um, you, we see that particularly, Merrifield argues this in relation to the distribution of these later steeple bottles. The distribution also <coughs> reflects the source of the German stoneware that's coming in uh, into London through the port site of London um, and then sort of trading elsewhere um, through southern England and, and, and beyond. Potteries in the Rhine area controlled much of the trade until the mid to the late 17th <coughs> century when British potteries also started making uh, stoneware and perhaps the increased availability of stoneware accounts for these increased numbers that seem to appear uh, in the 17th century. So, this one works. <laughs> 
Okay, so I want to, that was really just a bit of background, and those of you who work with you know, questions of folklore and magic will be familiar with all of that already. <laughs> what I want to do today is use these objects to think about the constitution of the modern body. This is a period, six, late 16th century and into the 17th century, is a period radically changing sen sense of self, a, cha a shift in the way that interior subjectivity seems to be understood, and of course, uh, anxiety about bodies and souls connected to all of these sort of religious upheavals. It's a period that's identified as, by historians, by many different historians, as the sort of origin point for the liberal humanist subject. And it's a moment when an understanding of a hidden, bounded, interiorized self emerges. And this is often contrasted with earlier medieval theories of the self. So what I want to do is to explore how far these vernacular objects, these sort of folk objects, can offer another strand of evidence, another way of thinking about some of these changes in contrast to the textual sources uh, that are usually used by historians. Uh, David Hillman, in a book called Shakespeare's Entrails in 2006, explores how the modern separation of material body and immaterial mind had not yet emerged in the early modern period. Instead, he argues that people were conceptualized in terms of what he calls a resolutely materialist physicality. <coughs> he says that when we look at Shakespeare's language of internal organs, <coughs> we think of it, we tend to think of it now as metaphorical, but really at the time it was understood much more literally. So when we think about the interiority of the <coughs> self, he argues, um, in, the mid, in the early modern period, this was actually inseparable from the interior of the body. So we have to think the interiority of the self with the body. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, Jan Pernis has explored the role of the stomach in the constitution of the person in the early modern period. And she notes that before the Cartesian mind-body sort of model became prevalent, the stomach was, in, was considered to be important in feeling and in thinking. And in many ways, we're sort of coming full circle back to that today. Um, she claims the stomach as a site through which class, gender, and ethnicity were mapped. And she notes, of course, Queen Elizabeth's famous speech in which she's claimed to have said, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. Hernes observes how this linking of heart and stomach assigns them with equal value and points to the importance of these two bodily organs <coughs> together in how self and identity were understood. The stomach, she suggests, played a particularly important role in the emotions. So besides nail clippings and hair and urine that are found in these bottles, the witch bottle also draws attention to three com key components of the body. The bottle itself emphasizes the head through the grimacing face that it's attached to, to its neck but also the belly, gorged and distended, holding the liquid within. And then inside a number of bottles have also been found felt hearts, often pierced with pins. And this triad of head, heart and belly was, was central to early modern conceptions of self. Uh, Galenic medical traditions divided the body into three regions, each governed by its organs, <coughs> the brain, heart and liver. So here we have a kind of persisting medieval model of the body in the context of changing conceptions of self and embodiment in the 16th to 17th century. So we think of uh, pottery vessels as, oh, go back, which way am I going? As obvious metaphors for the body. So, um, and this sort of organizes modern understandings of self and self subjectivity. And we see this obviously even in the <coughs> terminology that we use for the pots that we study, right? So there's a very clear kind of metaphorical mapping of bodies and pots. But we also, um, this also plays out in the language that we use, which compares us as people, as persons, to fragile and breakable vessels. So we have these, all this sort of language of emotions being contained by the body and boiling over, right? So cracking and shattering uh, imagery. Um, and this, of course, has deep roots in Christian tradition. Uh, there's old Testament imagery of clay, which is more uh, an image, imagery of shaping rather than containing, but, but certainly the idea of humans being made of clay. And also in Pauline letters, letters from Paul 
where the image of the body as a vessel is made a little more explicit. So we certainly we have that, that heritage that's being drawn on here. But it's also important to ask why and how was the Renaissance and early modern body like a vessel? Was it like a vessel in the way that we conceive of bodies as being like vessels? And if not, how did it differ? So for example, the term pot-bellied um, seems to date to around this period. It's first attested um, for, uh, in 1657. Of course, it's probably in use long before that, but certainly in the 17th century. And then the, the idea of the belly as being a sort of bulging part or concave surface of anything is first attested at the end of the 16th century. So we can sort of see here, you know, just sort of changing conceptions even of the way that bellies are conceptualized at this period. And bellies seem to be important to these objects, um, but perhaps not bellies as we imagine them. And of course, this also goes for other elements. Which bottle practice is distinct to England um, and New England as well, to a lesser extent, but these stoneware bottles are found throughout Europe and beyond <laughs> throughout the period of the witch trials. So we can ask, you know, why are we not finding them elsewhere if the bottle is such a sort of naturalized and obvious substitute for the body? And also, why are older traditions of face vessels like medieval uh, face jugs, for example, why are those not used in similar kinds of practices? Why does this emerge at this particular moment? It's not enough to say that these sort of developed at the time together with the period of witch persecutions. We have to think kind of carefully about why was this particular form chosen and what did it offer? So let's see if this slide works. Yeah, okay. So on first sight, we can sort of think about the body as vessel as constituting the body as a kind of bounded and fragile entity analogous to, to a, a fragile vessel that can break. It has its heart at its center and clearly is an important element in, of its constitution by the 17th century. But whose body is, con is conjured here? We know from accounts of practices that these were defensive devices. Uh, they were used to protect people, even though the bottle itself seems to represent the witch with its sort of fearsome face, the bodily contents come from the victim. So they're very confusing objects from the perspective of the modern person. And this has led to suggestions that the bottle kind of represents the victim. It represents the patient, if you like, rather than the witch. And it's de designed to trap and torture the witch by fooling it into thinking that it's uh, attacking the victim. I think, you know, that's certainly, that's an element that's going on here. But I think perhaps more interestingly, uh, we need to think about how it conjures different kinds of personhood uh, and how it's a working through of the changing constitution of self and body at this key historical juncture. Uh, when we think about sympathetic magic, we know that it works along two contrasting axes. On the one hand, similarity, and on the other, contagion. And we can see here the face mask and perhaps the vessel being like the, the witch um, and the, the, the heart inside, perhaps also uh, representing the witch's heart stuck with pins. But then it's also contagious in its physical connection through the inclusion of parts of the body of the victim, of the patient, right, sort of nails and hair and so on, and urine. So anyone who has a younger brother will be familiar <laughs> with, with this and with the ways in which humans can act on each other at a distance, right? We don't need social media to torment each other, that we have plenty of other ways of acting on others at a distance. And witchcraft really elaborates around this concern and works from the assumption that people can act on others at a distance. Uh, in the case of the witch bottle, the body is understood to penetrate into and circulate through the world through its physical connection with these excised parts and secretions. So I want to just read you here a contemporary, contemporaneous description <coughs> of the witch bottle, which is very well known in literature. If you've read anything on witch bottles, you'll be familiar with this quotation. It's rather wonderful, describes how witch bottles are used. So the urine of the patient is stopped up, closed in a bottle, and into it are put three nails, pins or needles with a little white salt, keeping the urine always warm. If you let it remain long in the bottle, it will endanger the witch's life. So the first thing to note here is the concern with urine and with heat. The stop, also the stoppering of bodily excretions 
in line with Galenic theories of the bodily humors and temperaments is always a bad thing. Uh, fluids and the excretions of the body have to flow for the continuance of good health. And you can sort of think about the concern in medieval medicine with you know, urine and with bleeding and you know, sort of the flow of, of fluids um, through the body. And the application of heat seems to have been an important element in some, but probably not all, cases. <clears throat> but how do we make sense of the fact that both the witch and the victim seem to be represented in the same vessel? Well, Blagrave enlightens us, he continues on, saying the reason is because there's part of the vital spirit of the witch in it. For such is the subtlety of the devil that he'll not suffer the witch to infuse any poisonous matter into the body of man or beast without some of the witch's blood mingled with it. So as Ralph Merrifield points out, the witch has established a kind of magical link of sympathy with the victim. And through this, the witch him on herself can be attacked. <coughs> so the victim's urine and hair and nails contain a distributed part of the witch. It's a very different way of thinking about, <coughs> about personhood. A different way of thinking about the body and its extensions. One which sees the potential for other bodies to penetrate one's own and for parts of other bodies to be left behind in doing so. So in this context, it doesn't make sense to argue that the witch bottle represents either the patient or the witch, but rather that they, it represents both and their entwined biographies. Um, at the same time, the use of the vessel as a metaphor for the body and the choice of the bellamine uh, jug shows a concern with the bounded body, one which makes a ceramic vessel an appropriate metaphor. You know, think of the tight cork stoppering that has allowed the material inside to be retained for all these centuries. It's very important that actually things don't flow um, from one to the other. So this is a bounded body that's very different from understanding to the body as a vessel for the soul that developed subsequently or um, through the, the early modern period. Here we have a vessel with the heart at its center and where the proper circulation of fluids through the body is a concern. Clearly, there are anxieties about bodily boundaries, about the invasion of the body that are expressed through these practices. And to use Heidegger as interpreted by Edward Casey, we can see how these anxieties were negotiated through the gathering of boundaries and their holding in space, or in place rather. Looking at the specifics of placement, vessels are buried at these boundary sites, marking the edges of place and securing it as a contained and bounded entity but they're also placed at vulnerable points of transition, particularly at thresholds and chimneys, acting to regulate passage into and out of place in the same way that bodily excretions are also regulated, in this case, stoppered up in the witch bottle. So Diane Perkis has suggested that the witch disrupted the boundaries between the house and the exterior world, entering uninvited and sometimes through the medium of the familiar Dangerous and sharp objects were taken and not returned or left where they shouldn't be. And these conflicts over witchcraft often took place in the domestic space. So this um, uh, through concerns over children's food and animals. So the concern with bodily boundaries is therefore mediated through this holding of boundaries more generally, simultaneously telling us something about placemaking um, through which witches were constituted uh, and through which, as Edward Casey has pointed out, through which modes of containment themselves were also constituted. You know, so we have to ask the question of what comes forward and what recedes, what is emphasized and what is excluded. Um, the swollen berry, belly of the witch bottle is one in which the humors have been stoppered up and stopped from flowing. And um, these anxieties over flows of uh, excretions, oh, it's not gonna, not gonna show, not to worry are also gendered. Um, so just to finish, we want to also just remember that the vast majority of witches that were accused and convicted in the trials of the time were female, to the point where some authors portray the witch craze as a gendered persecution of women. But these vessels are associated with this masculine bearded face. Um, and of course, we can think about how women's bodies within the Galenic tradition were also viewed as colder and wetter and more malleable than those of men, more fertile and more liable to decay. But witches, like witch bottles, were hard and intractable 
they inverted the usual understanding of female bodies as more open and permeable. In one trial, for example, a, a magistrate tried to cut, cut a witch's hair and it bent the scissors, or the scissors broke, and they would try to prick them with pins which would bend. So it's got this very hard, um, problematically female body in that sense. So perhaps this masculine imagery then is not simply incidental, um, but it's rather, rather appropriate because it sort of speaks to these concept perceptions of witches and their masculine attributes as drier and harder than women should be with boundaries that are simultaneously problematically more durable and more extended and extendable. Um, so witch bottles, I think, you know, just to finish, have a lot to tell us about changing understandings of the body in the 16th and 17th century. In particular, they point to an emergent concern with the bounded body in popular culture, a concern within which the body isn't conceptualized as a fragile vessel for the soul, but rather one in which body and soul were materially <coughs> tied together with heart and stomach at the center. But perhaps it also illustrates why the dualistic understanding of the body as a vessel, whether for soul or a vessel for the mind, why that um, understanding would come to have such metaphoric power. In some ways, the space for its acceptance had already been prepared. In the context of witch bottles, we can see sort of already see the echoes of the sort of flow of the Galenic flow of substances <coughs> in, the, in the metaphors of the body as we use them today. And by the 18th century, Bartman vessels, like the ones we've seen previously, were no longer uh, being made. But perhaps, and, and we've seen how there's a shift to other forms of, of bottle at this time, perhaps we can posit that the iconic echoes of the witch in the belly and the <coughs> gruesome face were no longer necessary anyway. Because by this point, by the 18th century, the stoppered steeple bottle acted already as an obvious and graspable me metaphor for the body and for the soul that it contained. Thank you.